Hello, pod smashers of the internet, and welcome to another episode of Itty Beard, Itty Beard, Itty Beard, Pod Smash, where gaming goes to grab a beer. We're your hosts, Penguin and Termite. I'm Penguin. I am Termite, and we are a weekly video game podcast smashing together ideas that you care about with video games. That's right, and tonight we were inspired by the month that we are now in as of the time of this airing. We are in the month of March, and March is a freaking crazy... I don't think I've ever seen a month this jam-packed full of game releases um, since I've been following this kind of thing. Uh, I say month, I actually mean the past two months, pretty much. But we're going to talk about this idea of like when game, you know, this this idea of games releasing on the same day or on the same week or month. Um, just this idea of simultaneous game releases and the effect that that has on not just the success or failure of those specific games but on the culture, right? The zeitgeist and uh, the attitudes around those games as they come out in such close proximity time-wise to another. It is a year like this, I think is pretty rare, but it it happens frequently, right? It's happened over the course of time. So we're going to talk about some of the most notable times it's happened in the past. And then we're also going to talk about how crazy it is that it's happening in such like aggressive strokes this year. So we will get to all of that and more, but we are where gaming goes to grab a beer. So what are you drinking tonight? I am repping Star Hill Brewery once again. That is just under a half a mile walking distance from my house. Um, They have a IPA that I'd never had before until I saw it there. They have it on tap and I bought bottles. It's called the Grateful, just Grateful Session IPA. Uh, It is, I don't think there's anything fun on the bottle here to read. Nope. But it's very juicy. It's kind of tropical. Um, they say hoppy, citrus, and balanced. I, I think that's that nails it. It's a session IPA, so it's not ridiculously boozy. It's very lightweight. Perfect for March in the spring when you're feeling, you're pining for warmer weather and you want to be outside, uh, but you also want to drink a couple of these and not um, get blitzed. I drank three, I think, during a, a NASCAR race, and it was wonderful, and I did not get hung over or bloated or super drunk it was exactly what i needed spaced out over the course of six hours so i'm drinking one of those tonight nice i am drinking of the other beer that i got i talked last week about how i went to snowshoe and the other beer that i got uh the actual this is the one that i actually bought and the one that i had last week was the freebie she gave me um the the very kind lady who Mm -hmm. operated the hops and vines store in snowshoe and snowshoe village but this is uh this is the one I actually bought the one I saw, and I got it because it has such an interesting set of um, ingredients. It's called a buckwheat honey porter, and it's from Screech Owl Brewing, and they are located in Ooh, interesting Br- Brewston Brewston Mills, West Virginia. Huh? She said they just stocked the the Screech Owls. Anyways, buckwheat honey porter. Yeah, that's I mean that's that's its ingredients, right? It's buckwheat and honey. It says here, a dark, rich porter made with English malts and yeast and a healthy dose of buckwheat honey rounds. Reveal flavors like nothing you have ever tasted baking within or in a beer. You can almost smell the buckwheat cakes baking within this well-balanced aromatic brew. Welcome to Prestonian's Mm. home for the annual buckwheat festival. I don't actually know what buckwheat honey is. It definitely tastes farmy <laughs> right like uh yeah, weedy like definitely mm-hmm. weedy and very um like earthy yeah but it is that sounds like buckwheat got that little bit of yep. sweet in it and it's multi it's a multi-porter right like the rest of it's just that multi-porter and i'm i'm swear man again we we talk a lot about the difference between porters and stouts on the podcast because whenever we're drinking them we usually bring it up this one man it mm-hmm. it, it it's on that edge too like it's thick uh, it is it is not as strong as I would like. I think that was my biggest criticism of it when I first sipped it was I had I had one with my wife um, the night we got them and it was 4.5 percent alcohol as opposed to something stronger, which I would have preferred. But it is still good. <laughs> so good flavor, good flavor. Right. And and both of the beers I've had from West Virginia so far, like from West Virginia Brewing, have been like very yeah. like flavorful, like almost not overly flavorful, but like flavor, strong flavors coming through, not just that beer. So it may just be a coincidence, but I'm wondering if there's something in the water over there. So anyways, mm. that is what I'm having. So cool. Anything you want to banter about before we move on? Yeah, let's let's give our Horizon first impressions. Sure, I mean. Like a kind of a brief, yeah. obviously not a full review because yeah, yeah. we're both still at the beginning of the game, but it's out. We've been playing it now for almost a week. Uh, especially since this the audience listened to so it, it'll have been week, out, bro. We've you know, been like three days. 
Oh, 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 oh you're right. Since the episode, yeah. or all, well, since well, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay, well, I was I was both like cutting the difference between sure, us sure, having sure. time no, to play it's, it it's and audience really listening to it since it's released. Yeah. How many hours have you logged into it? I'm curious. Like, what's your save file say? Probably like five or six. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm I'm much higher than it's that. It's somewhere in there. I am. All right, I'll explain what I'm doing. I'm mainlining the story because uh, Elden Ring has not yet released yet. So Elden Ring's coming out the Friday uh, after we record this. And I I don't mind not getting the platinum before Elden Ring comes out, but I'm going to feel really discombobulated if I have to like drop the story halfway through. Because it's, it's actually a really, really good story. Really compelling. So I was pretty much gripped uh, the story from the beginning. So I was like, I, I need to mainline this story, which is not the way I prefer to play a game like Horizon. I like to explore and dither and level up a bit before tackling all the story stuff. So I'm really playing against my instincts here and just skipping everything, but I really just want to get that done. And then I'll mop up the platinum later, which according to the trophy mm-hmm. guide, Power Picks, is actually the, the fastest way to do it because of something you get at the end of the game. But uh, yeah, that's what I'm doing and I'm loving it. Like I said, the story's great. I did predict... Yeah, I kind of took like, oh, a saying. half day on Friday, which gave me like half of my playtime of the five to six hours that I've done. I am also mainlining the story because of what you just said, where you unlock something at the end. I don't know what that thing is huh. yet, yeah. but the trophy guides say to finish the story, you'll unlock all of the things that help you get everywhere else. And sure enough, like even already, there's doors that are locked that say you will get something later to unlock these doors. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to go through and methodically hit every question mark on the map if when half of them, them I'm not even going to be able to yeah. mess with anyway. Right. So and I know you get a certain type of traversal mechanic later that I won't spoil here that makes traversing the world easier. So that'll be easier to hit the question marks around. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm similarly doing the same thing, but I'm not rushing as hard as you are for Elden Ring. I am going to pick up Elden Ring on day one. Uh, and so like the weekend got crazy because we've had a lot of things going on with family and we, and my favorite things will indicate some fun things we did, but um yeah, so I haven't had as much time to sneak into it now, but I have like I hundred percented the first tutorial area. So there's like the first five hours of the game or so is the farthest eastern point of the Forbidden West. And you work your way west, and there's a big threshold, a big story moment that happens, and then everyone knows you get a glider. That's not a spoiler. There's a point, it's about five hours in where you get the glider, and that's where I'm like, okay, from this point on, it's now main story. So I did all of like there's some towers to explore, there's some things to do, some like events to do in town, extra side quests. Like I did all of that stuff just to get my hands on the game and like get a feel for everything and how it works and how to traverse and navigate all the menus and like all that stuff and that's one of the points that i wanted to make really quickly and i'll I'll let you speak is like jumping back into this world it does play exactly like the first one so except optimized Mm -hmm. yeah it's so similar but it's like they've iterated on it and what i hate about that is that (laughs) there's so much that you have to bring up like a wrote like a circle menu to change your weapons but you can also craft so there's like acid arrows regular arrows and then you can get a different type of bow which has a different type of arrow and you have to like crap and so you have to hold l1 and use joystick and then hold x and then sometimes almost 100 percent of the time when i want to do something i iterate through like six different things incorrectly before i land on the thing i'm actually trying to do something like sprinting and sliding and shooting a weak point on an enemy. Like it takes, I can't do that. I can't just muscle memory my way into that yet. Cause there's so much possibilities. There's different melee combos you can do and all those things. But the, so that to me is a little convoluted, but outside of that, it, it's very much the first game, just better. It's smoother. It plays better. It looks better. Uh, it feels better. Um, and that's not a bad thing. So I'm having a good time with it so far. What do you think? Yeah, um, uh, they've made a lot of quality of life improvements that are fantastic. Like now everything that is, like you only can carry a certain amount on your character at a time, which is from the the original game. But now anything that you pick up that's over, it gets automatically sent to your stash. It's like, oh my gosh, that was the worst part of the first game was like having to pick and choose resources, especially early in the game when it was like Mm -hmm. everything was needed. And yep. there was some other, the stash, or well, they have a stash for one, which is great. Uh, there mm-hmm. was something else, though, like a really good quality of life uh, improvement. When you scan but, the enemies and you can kind of cycle through its weak points. Yeah, that's that's To me, nice. that felt a little better. weak points, too. Yep, yep, yep. yep. Uh, there was something else, though, but, uh, oh, you can fast travel now without, um, as long as you're at, a, so there used to, there was an item that was really expensive to get, and I, like, dumped all my shards on it at the beginning of the game in HCD because I wanted it so badly, but it basically is unlimited fast travel item. Well, they obli- uh, they abolished that, so now you still have to make fast travel packs. But if you're at a fireplace, you can now fast travel to any other fireplace you've discovered, 
without having to burn a fast travel pack. So if you're out in the world, you have yeah. to burn a fast travel yep. pack. But now, so that was like a big quality of life improvement too. I was like, that's smart. And it took the me forever. bonfires I just are... found that today. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. The, the yeah. campfires are save points anyway. So most of the time you're looking yeah. for a campfire to kind of yep. in between story beats or in between things anyway. So if that's your fast travel point for free, that's wonderful. That's a great gameplay design. Yeah. Yeah. So the other, oh, the other point I was going to ha- say is it's, it's beautiful, right? Like it's a beautiful game. They definitely improved the visuals, but you can also still tell that a lot of the the engine they're using is still kind of designed for old hardware for PS4. There's just some a couple of graphical like the big one I mm-hmm. always comment on is her hair. It's like anytime she just like it's twitches, wild. It's like, like, like it's like, everywhere, but it's, not, but it's and not everywhere in a sense that like normal hu- it does it doesn't abide by normal human hair physics. That's what right. I'm saying. She'll like yeah. she'll like literally tilt her head and the her hair will go. Bah! like fly over yeah. it's like a super saiyan it's crazy so uh <laughs> yeah but i mean other, like i have, they have some nitpicky things my my biggest pet peeve with like you said is it's very very similar i don't feel i think they have introduced some new mechanics but they don't get to that quickly enough so literally the first three weapons you unlock are the same exact weapons like from the first game Tripcaster. Mm-hmm slingshot and bow right and yep. you, you like and then some of it's luck and and the ability to like you have to buy a lot of weapons in this game which is fine it's refreshing i miss good old rpgs where you actually had to get stuff from the shopkeepers instead of just like them dropping or being in treasure chests but there's a lot of weapons you might miss out on just because you can't afford them right like i don't still don't have a spike caster or whatever i don't i just got the um the Karja, uh like the disc disc launcher or whatever and those are cool new weapons that should have been featured like from the get go. Right. Mm, yeah. I know. Yeah. Like you said, there's new mounts that you can get, but you don't get most of those till later in the game. There's new, there's obviously new enemies, but a lot of those enemies still kind of play the same as the old ones. Right. So, um, so yeah, I just, I feel like there's not a lot of new activities out in the world. So it's like, they really played it safe and that's Okay. But it just, I, I feel like they could have taken a lot more risks and gambles and put their best foot forward as far as like making it feel like, oh yeah, this is a new, whole new experience. The biomes mm-hmm. for the most part are still the same, right? Like they, they really featured all this like jungle stuff and water exploration, but, and yes, you can explore the water. That's great. But you don't get the thing that allows you to breathe underwater until later. So it doesn't like give, I still don't have it by the way. So it just it doesn't oh, feel wow. like I'm doing a lot a lot with it right yeah so there's the, the biomes is like snowy area there's a snowy and a beach area, area. A desert area the beach is the only one that we didn't really see a lot of in the original games so that one i am yeah. looking forward to but again i'm still not there yet so everything i've seen so far in the game is just like desert beach farmish kind of place which is a little different but we didn't spend a lot of time there it's just it, it, mountains and then like hmm. lots of like canyons and stuff so i'm just like I don't know. I just, it feels really samey, right? Is all I'm saying. And that that's not necessarily a bad thing because the first game was so great. But yep. I'm like, you guys really need to break up this formula somehow with some some new stuff. Uh, and mm-hmm. they need, the gorillas should have put their best foot forward uh, with entirely new, new machines and new, new weapon mechanics from the get go. That's my only really big criticism. Everything else is fine, right? It's either, it's everything yep. else is, is ranges from great to fine, <laughs> right? Where it's just yeah. like, yeah, there's some mediocre choices. But overall, like the game's still really, really fun, and I'm having a blast, basically injecting it straight into my veins via my eyeballs. And yep, <laughs> and then the story in is me. Great. The I did. Oh, uh, that's what I was gonna say uh, before. Before you cut me off, the first time when I was talking about the story. Oh, sorry. I did. Yeah. Pre- it's okay. Uh, I wanted to get you, wanted you to get your thoughts out. I did predict the major story twist from the very first prologue. Granted, apparently this story twist was thought out in advance because the Horizon fandom, which I'm not a huge, I'm not a big follower of like the Reddit or whatever, but I have a friend who said, I have a friend who is, and he said that he's been following it and the they, the fans predicted the twist of this game back in, yeah, back from the first game, the, the data logs or whatever, like foreshadowing. Uh, was so, it related to the end credit scene of the first game? No. I think the end credit oh. scene you're talking about is when Hades gets like brought into the lantern by Silence. Yeah. You're talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, no, that's not the big twist. Uh, so oh, okay. you clearly haven't gotten there yet. So anyways, there was a data log apparently that like foreshadowed this twist and interesting. That said, I didn't, I obviously wasn't part of that, <laughs> but I did figure it out pretty much when after the pro, like the prologue happened and I'm like, Oh, okay. I know what's going to happen in this now. So yeah, it's pretty cool, and I can't wait till you get there so we can talk about it. But I'm just glad they nice. thought about it ahead of time, like that this was part of the plan all along. 
Uh, mm. It makes it feel like the game was, it wasn't just like, we need something crazy to happen in this game. Uh, it was, it was thought out beforehand. So yeah. anyways, and that's the last all my thoughts. thing. Go you ahead. you had mentioned something that you just found out like today after how many hours of playing. I similarly had an experience where I didn't realize you can scan the climbable surfaces to actually highlight mm-hmm. what is climbable and what's not. So yes. in the past with like Uncharted games and Horizon Zero Dawn, the first one, everything that was climbable was obviously like painted, painted. in white. And yep. Tomb Raider mm-hmm. does that too. It's like everything is painted in white. You know exactly where you can actually climb. Yep. Every in other this game, cliff you is cannot. just a- border yep mm-hmm. yeah and so like, you can scan with your little focus thing which is, it looks exactly like death stranding which is a great callback to the same yep. engine they the use Decima which engine, i thought yep. was kind of cool that's engine exactly and it has little yellow marks where you can climb and everything else is red that you cannot and i it took me i was way late trying to climb a tower and i didn't realize you could do that until i did it by accident and i was like oh nice. i'm sure i skipped it's tutorial nice, or something uh, i think people i remember when horizon zero dawn came out and because it begged the comparison to breath of the wild having come out so similarly i was sitting there being like ah it sucks that everything's like predetermined climbing and i wish you could just climb every surface like you can in breath of the wild and it sounds like they kind of heard that feedback a lot because this seems like a really good middle ground where it's like you can climb a lot of surfaces that you wouldn't think you can climb but you can't climb every surface which actually makes sense is true to reality right the fact that link can climb every surface is actually the fantastic fantastical thing so i like that they melded it well with the the focus right so you can just scan it and if you can climb it you can see it if you can't climb it you can't see it i think that's that's really really clever um design so yeah i like that too all right, well, Horizon Zero Dawn is quickly, or sorry, Forbidden West is quickly becoming one of our favorite things, but... Doing this podcast is our favorite thing. Doing this podcast is our favorite thing. My favorite thing is quick, Horizon. Forbidden West is probably my favorite thing. But nice. I also have another one on top of that. I didn't get to talk about it last week. I got a headset, finally, 3D. Yes, you did. 3D audio wireless headset. It is uh, one that a uh, website you and I both use. You actually introduced me to it. That is good for comparing hardware, equipment, accessories, and stuff like that. They rated it actually higher than the Sony Pulse um, for the same kind of price point. And it's actually, it was, it retail's cheaper sometimes. I've seen it for both like 120 and 90 retail. But I got it uh, used off of Mercari, uh, which is like an eBay like an eBay competitor and it came in pretty much mint condition. I got it for like 40 bucks, 45, 50 bucks after the shipping and all that stuff shook out. So I was quite pleased with the purchase, saving some money and having a really, really good quality headset. I'm not actually using it right now. If you're wondering, um, because I haven't <laughs> to the PlayStation, but I have been using it for both the PlayStation and the computers kind of moving the dongle back and forth, but it's great. It's awesome. It's the uh, it's Logitech G five, three, three. If you are curious and want to get this favorite thing yourself, you can look it up. Yeah, Logitech G533. Uh, lots of used ones out there for pretty affordable prices. Just obviously, you risk it being crappy condition, et cetera, et cetera. But mm-hmm. mine was perfect. Mine came in perfect condition. So I was super happy with it. So yeah, nice. that's my favorite thing. What's your favorite Woo! thing? My favorite thing was that weekend I mentioned where I couldn't play Horizon Zero Dawn was because Saturday we hired a babysitter to come sit while, uh, well, we have two kids. The older one was at my mom's for the weekend. He's having a three day weekend at Camp Grandma's. And the little one, we had offered to pay a babysitter to come sit in our house after we had put the little one to bed. So she didn't have to do anything except for like watch our TV and do her homework and such. Uh, so it was a wonderful, like stress free, everything's going to be fine. And we'll get a phone call. We went out to dinner and we went to this place called tavern and grocery which is not a grocery store but it kind of is a tavern so i don't know why it's called that but it was very much an old school tavern restaurant that served almost fine dining food uh ridiculously good cocktails like a throwback if you're from the fredericksburg area there was a restaurant called kai Becca that had the best cocktails in the area and this place matched their quality it was incredible i had a thing called i want to say sword and shield but it wasn't shield it was sword and something else and I can't remember the name. And that was delicious, but a little too fruity for me. Uh, it had a scotch mixed in with some Campari and some other like syrupy type things. It wasn't too sweet, but it was still like fruity for me. And uh, then I had an old fashioned, of course, off the menu, whichever special old fashioned they have. And it was money using uh, Jefferson's. There's a bourbon with Jefferson's name in it. And I don't remember what it's called. I think it's VSB or something. Um, 
absolutely incredible. No muddled fruit. Uh, it had a perfect um, orange rind in it uh, with some bitters, and it had they had dissolved some simple syrup in there that they had made house made simple syrup, and it was wonderful. Uh, we had I had a bison steak, which I always order steaks rare, and oh, it was just out of this world, absolutely incredible quality. So my wife and I had a great night out, awesome meal, great cocktails. It was just awesome. So that when you have two children and you can't do that anytime you want, it's just, you just soak that in. Even if it's just for a night, you know, it wasn't overnight, but it was just for an evening out and it was awesome. So that's my favorite thing. Sweet. Awesome. All right. My, oh, that, I guess that's, and the favorite thing. You did it already. Headphones. To our last, yeah. Yeah, that's our last segment. So that leads us to our, our second last segment. That leads us to our last mm-hmm. segment, which is DLC. DLC stands for downloadable content. It is a segment of our show where we have a fun little mini discussion that may or may not be related to our topic. That is meant to just get your wheels turning and uh, a conversation you might not have ever had about video games. I do not have one prepared tonight. So Ooh. this one's going to be a blank blank. Blank, 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 real quick. Fast one, too. So, blank, blank is inspired by the age old conversation who would win in a fight? X character or Y character, X person, Y person, my dad, your dad. Uh, your dad would totally win in a fight. Your dad's scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's pretty jacked. But it's not that. We pick a different competition. So, he's go- one of us is going to pick a competition. One of us is going to pick characters. None of us, neither of us know ahead of time what the other is going to pick. And we just kind of go with it. And uh, so, do you want, which do you want? Do you want to pick the competition or you want to pick the characters? Character. Characters. Okay. All right. Then I will pick a, a one competition. character. The characters. Two characters. Two characters from vi- two any video characters. game. Right, because they got to compete, one. right? So you got one person's going to, and you don't know Ooh, what the competition is. You know, I haven't is, made a so reference to in a blind. long time. I think it's due. No, 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 no. <laughs> no Metal Gear Solid. No, unless it's a character <laughs> that's not Solid Snake. You can do any of the other characters in Metal Gear Solid, but Solid Snake. And uh, we haven't done Blank Blank in a while, so of course we haven't mentioned it. We've been able to get like good solid DLCs for a while. Not that this is not a good solid DLC, but anyways, the point is we'll pick it. Neither of us knows what you're going to going to pick. So we're going to decide then after the choices have been made, who is going to win in this competition. So you have your characters picked. I do. All right. I'm going to go with ski jumping. Cause it's the Beijing Olympics and oh, super yeah. controversial, crazy nonsense is happening. So Yikes. let's celebrate that yeah. by making fun of it, I guess. And sure. uh, so <laughs> Who would win ski jumping in the Beijing Olympics between? Wow. I have Jack from Jack and Daxter. Okay. And I have Deacon St. John from Days Gone. You picked I'm that one feeling... often, too. Do I really? <laughs> yeah. I... Oh, well, you've notably picked it multiple times, but sure. Interesting. I'm feeling a Jack, personally, my initial instinct. I, I think as about well. Deacon. Yeah. Well, Deacon St. John is like, kind of a biker but soft-hearted very grounded and realistic hardened but yet lovable i would not put skiing as something he could do well he's like a like i say he's a biker dude so like shooting he's really good at and sprinting sure and like tactical assessment of how to handle zombie hordes sure but i would not put like skiing in there but jack on the other hand there was combat racing involved through Jack X combat racing. Uh, yeah. There was other spinoffs. I just feel like there was mini games in various of the three Jack games, Jack one, two and three, uh, where he would have done things very like hoverboarding and other stuff. That's very similar to like going down a mountain on skis. So I feel like that would go to Jack. Yeah. Pretty quickly. I think so too. I think that's pretty easy. I do think the Deacon St. John might win, though, the moral victory of criticizing China, whereas Jack has to be true, has to not be that <laughs> Jack's cartoon character. He's just going to be yeah. like, yay. And he's he's like he also has to have mass appeal in China. Right. Like that's probably. <laughs> oh, ooh, <laughs> probably. You're right? really digging deep. Yeah, that's exactly right. He does have to yeah. have mass appeal in China and he can't be offensive like, at even all. Even though he's... Sony and Sony Bend might feel the need to. The publisher, right? They might feel the need to like kowtow to China a little bit. Uh, the character himself, Deacon St. John, be like, nah. All right. That is, uh, that is that. That is DLC. Then, <laughs> 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 right, which leads us 
to our main topic. If it feels like we're rushing through this episode, it's because we both want to go play Horizon Forbidden West. <laughs> oh, I thought it was because <sighs> our banter about Horizon Forbidden West was long. It was also pretty long, yeah. You're right. But also, mm-hmm. we want to be, and, and having bantered about it, now I really want to play it even more. So, thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> All right. So, we're talking about simultaneous game releases. The, the range, I think, that we're both comfortable with are games uh, anywhere between a month and a year of each other, though. A month and a year. Ah, mm, month a and, a, and day. a day. Yeah. Oh. The day, everything down to the day, but like the month is the longest. And Mm -hmm. obviously games come out in the same month all the time. It's not always as notable, but there were a couple. But if there's like five games in a month, that's a different story. So obviously this is kind of flexible in regards to, you know, it's sort of like dependent on like time versus the number of games. But there's also one really big standout in that, too, that we'll talk about. The other kind of caveat I guess I'd make here is we're talking mostly about like main triple A big Big. release highly anticipated releases Mm -hmm. or at least game or or you know we might even cover some remasters and stuff of games that were also big that are also highly anticipated remasters so those are the kinds of things that we're going to be mostly covering i actually left one off my list and i'll have to talk about it but i don't know when it comes out exactly so i might be like quickly looking up that up. i got you you those are kind of uh yeah can you look up the release date of the new guild wars expansion because i'm pretty sure i did not include that i'm pretty sure it comes out within Mm. the range of time we're talking about Okay, and just add it to the list. Don't tell me, because we'll talk about it. Just add it. You have the notes Got in front it. of you, and you can add it. Cool. All right, so those, yeah, so those things. The, obviously, we're talking about a range of, like, X amount of games, X to Y amount of games within a day, anywhere between a day of each other to a month of each other. And that's what we're kind of calling simultaneous game releases. Um, so we're going to start with the first question, which is, what is so crazy? Why, what inspired this episode, basically? So I will say it, uh, the first quarter of this year is jam-packed with games so much that i don't think i've ever seen a quarter just a single quarter this jam-packed full of games and in particular march 25th has three whopping major releases scheduled to come out granted any one of these games could be delayed between now and then but this close to march it's pretty there's a lot of confidence in these games in fact i think one of them is already gold so yeah we're going to talk about what's so crazy we're going to talk about all the all the things that have contributed to it. We'll go through the list of games in this quarter. Of course, the first quarter being January through March. And then we're going to talk about March 25th and why it's so lit and what games are coming out. So I just kind of jotted down. This is, this is list is from Wikipedia, but I didn't include everything from Wikipedia. So you can see the like 2022 games list on Wikipedia for yourself. I didn't include everything. I just kind of included all the kind of major titles that I know you and I for sure, at least have like an eye on or some interest in. And it's neither, it's not, like I said, it's not a comprehensive list. There's lots of mobile games and stuff and, and stuff coming out for the Switch for the first time uh, in this time frame. But I really was just trying to highlight the games that are like, oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow. <laughs> so do you want to start going through it? Sure. I do want to highlight the time frames of the year that are usually packed, uh, even if you expand beyond yes, a yes, single month. Mm-hmm. There's like there's a March, April time release window, like the spring or like quarter two of any given year yeah, and then Q1, there's a beginning of q2 it kind of it, yep. usually these days kind of bleeds into like may june so that's pretty common yeah mm-hmm. and, and even newer like more recent trends since monster hunter what's the one for ps4 that i remember uh, ice rise monster hunter rise not rise before that world oh shoot monster uh, hunter world, worlds yeah. mm-hmm. okay monster that's hunter it. world mm-hmm. came out in january and showed the world that you can actually release a game in January. So now things are kind of trickling back into February, but we'll get there. Mm-hmm. And then the other big window for release games is the fall, which we've had all oh, the big shooters always, always come yep. out. So between September and November I mean, is a huge window for so long. It's every really year. Like that was trend. always. Yeah. yeah. Like, so mm-hmm. yeah, between those, like that's usually what happens. And, and so Christmas, that's entirely because of right. the, you know, that black Friday mentality. We got to get sales. We got to drop these games because these are the ones that are going to sell for christmas and yep, so that's leading that, up to the that, holiday yep yeah that that was always it's fairly common in fact when we when we talk about times when this has happened in the past you'll see a lot of november october simultaneous releases but it's really recently that like suddenly you're starting to see things in march together and february together mm-hmm. which is just so early and yes highlights definitely a large shift in the trend of game releases um that has happened recently so thanks to monster hunter yes and so it's going into that knowing that here we go for just 2022 what is so crazy about quarter one yep (laughs) and quarter one ends what march 31st yeah Mm -hmm. okay so we have what we have had and will have 
Pokemon Arceus and Uncharted Legacy both drop January 28th. Dying Light yeah, 2, that's... February 4th. Sifu, February 8th. Lost Ark, that's the MMO by Amazon, mm-hmm. February 11th. Cyberpunk's Next Gen Updates, Shadow Drop, Surprise, February 15th. Horizon mm-hmm. Forbidden West, February 18th. Destiny 2, Witch Queen, coming out February 22nd. Guild Wars 2 expansion is February 28th. Oof. And out of order here a little bit because I copy and pasted incorrectly. Yep, Elden Ring coming out Friday the 25th. Babylon's Fall, March 3rd. Gran Turismo 7 and Triangle Strategy, March 4th. Grand mm-hmm. Theft Auto 5 Next Gen release, March 15th. Final Fantasy Origins Chaos Stranger, March 18th. And I don't care about the name of that. And then the whole reason why we're having this discussion, we have three big games dropping on one day. Ghostwire Tokyo. Kirby Forgotten Lands, Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, all three on March 25th. Uh, and then we have the PC version of Death Stranding's Director's Cut dropping March 30th. 19. Wow. If you're wondering, if you if you weren't keeping count, that's 19 games in one quarter. I'm not, like, rather, I am cherry-picking. I cherry-picked these games as, like, big games, big things that people have been anticipating and looking forward to. And that games, These are games that are dominating conversations they're dominating user metrics that are going to have journalism all about them i'm not like i wasn't just like getting scraping the bottom of the barrel of grabbing everything i could like this was a highly curated list (laughs) i was axing more games than i was like trying to pull so 20 games in one quarter that's a lot that I, i i feel like that's a lot like can you think of another example of that many games all coming out like that many titles of this caliber coming out in one quarter there was like 2019 was pretty lit. Like January 25th saw the release of Resident Evil That's 2 right. remake, and then the 29th mm-hmm. saw Kingdom Hearts 3, both in January, like two days apart. Uh, and then going into February of that year, we had Metro Exodus. I have actually I have a list of that. So 2019, we had uh, do, Anthem, I mean, Far, Crackdown yeah. 3, Far Cry New Dawn, and Metro Exodus all coming out in February. So like 2019 was packed, but it was, those... it was pretty packed. But that's 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 still a approximately two months and i feel like 2019 2019 was no 2020 was the year with like final fantasy there was there was a lot that happened in 2020 that all happened at once in spring but even so i still i'm pretty sure i can still count on two hands both of those years like games that came out all in the same quarter or within close proximity two hands it is getting busier like every year this is yeah well and i think this year in particular and, and the primary reason why that i wrote the reason why i think this quarter is the pandemic delays right like the there many of these games were scheduled to come out in fall of 2021 and got pushed or anytime right? anytime mm-hmm. in 2021 maybe yeah exactly like some got pushed a year some got pushed six months some got pushed three months some yeah, probably got I, pushed so a I month. Feel, but like i feel like yeah. this is 2021 slate of games that are all now trying to squeeze out before other stuff comes in 2022 and that is i think the primary thing that drove this particular craziness but you're right in general it's also just getting more more packed they seem to be less willing to you know delay their game just to avoid the release of another game um which mm-hmm. we'll kind of talk about some of the factors that go into that and then yeah march 25th as we as we mentioned it's gonna be lit because at least two of those games are like highly anticipated like major publisher major developer games ghostwire tokyo is kind of a newcomer the outlier and the untested one but it's still bethesda right like that's still it's it's a subsidiary of bethesda that makes ghostwire tokyo i believe so Mm -hmm. it's still pretty highly anticipated and it looks awesome it's definitely on my radar but yeah kirby a kirby open world kirby game first kind of major kirby release since the um the other one for the switch but like there's not a lot of kirby games that often come out so like that's a big deal and then yeah mm-hmm. borderlands spinoff that's based off of one of the best high, most highly regarded dlc campaigns in any game of all time yeah <laughs> like it's gonna be a big deal it's gonna be a big day uh and people are gonna have to make choices so uh, i think it's always fun to talk about these kinds of things that happen in the gaming industry because it seems like such an inco- on- inconsequential thing the release date but mm-hmm. when this kind of thing happens it really gets people excited and talking about it and sometimes frustrated so it brings out a whole like thing in the community so we'll we'll get to that what are the factors that go into making this decision though so when publishers are considering release considering release dates what are the factors and why is it typically considered important that games avoid releasing on the same day as other games there this is kind of an obvious answer to that question but let's dig into it yeah there's a wonderful article on gamesindustry.biz written by christopher dring published back in 2019 that just completely dissects this and like breaks down this entire topic which i found doing research for this very thing it's great that we're like 
were inspired by the fact that there's three major video game titles releasing on the same day. And, and we're all asking each other, like, why? Like, why, why would we do yeah. this? Mm-hmm. And then yeah. here we are. So the very first point is when to promote your game rather than when to release it. And, and a perfect example of this is the Just Dance franchise. They just release them every year, like at different times. It's this is a Ubisoft published game. It's like a dance family game, but it's promoted heavily leading into the party seasons. So like Halloween, Thanksgiving, mm-hmm. holidays, yeah. where people get together with their families and they do things together. Uh, that's when it's promoted heavily, regardless of its release time. So that's something that's kind of agnostic to launch time. So that's that's interesting. Does your game have a very specific audience? Looking at like January is usually a wash with Japanese games from Bandai Namco, Koei Tecmo, Square Enix, and Capcom. Publishers typically have a specific audience that will buy their products regardless of when they launch. Like they use Kingdom Hearts 3 as a perfect example here. doesn't matter when it's coming out. Kingdom Hearts fans are going to buy it. And JRPG fans, they're going to buy the next thing. Like, so you almost, that's a, that's a metric to look at. Like if you have a very niche audience, not a mainstream that doesn't expect your title. And a contrast to that would be the annualized things that drop in November. And that would be like your next Call of Duty, which always comes out in the fall. You always want to have a Call of Duty in the fall because that's when your fans expect it. But other things like these Japanese RPGs can just come out whenever because it's just going to happen and right. people are going to buy it. You already kind of know what you're what to expect for sales. So that you can pick a date You know, at that point agnostic to a hype around it. Uh, consider the marketing budget. How much money does your company have to run ad campaigns? And so... GamesIndustry.biz talks about speaking with XCOM-like Phoenix Point Snapshot Games. The team backed the game with a Facebook ad campaign to drive pre-orders. It resulted in very little initially as the campaign started in October and it was struggling to be seen. But in January, pre-orders had spiked. Marketing costs in the early parts of the year are cheaper. I had no idea. That's crazy to me. Like Even thinking about how much marketing costs varies throughout the year and because january is that like dip after the holidays where everything's quiet and calm and no one's really like going crazy because they just did it's kind of like a great time to jump out and get some marketing get some ads like on the cheap right in in january so like looking at the cycles of the year and when you can talk about your game and when you have the space to do that uh, that's fascinating to me another aspect of all of this is consider the media if you are bumping up so you think about like reviewers right you have go to metacritic go look at all of the like kosher reviewers like who's out there like reviewing your game if you're going to drop a game close to a huge title like horizon forbidden west or rewind the clock go back to like red dead redemption 2 these big meaty open world games you have to know that it's going to take a while for your reviewers to get through those big chunky games and so do you want to take your like your cool new indie idea and drop it next to a big monster like that and have any space in the media with which to be talked about. You're not, it's not going to happen or like your big call of duties, your destinies. And so like considering what the media is doing and what they're reviewing and what they're posting about on their websites and what's right, what they're writing about to try and get as many eyeballs as possible. Like you want your, your game to bubble up to the top. So you don't want to do that. So you have to consider that as well. But yet here we are with three games releasing on the same day. Consider sales. Things there's the regular cycle of capitalist like when I say sales, I mean like specials. Something is cheaper than it usually is. So we have like Black Friday, we have Steam Winter Sale. If you turn on the TV on President's Day, you're inundated with car salesman ads, President's Day sale at Ford or like furniture store President's Day sales. So like knowing what the sale periods are, the specials that are running in the gaming industry and what time is it, what times of year those things run, you might actually like be lost to all of that hoopla and if you launch a game and then it's immediately a sales time, you're going to get lost unless you take a cut on your game price. So it's kind of complicated like there you go. So do you want to be to be out there against a competitor that's going to have a price cut? Because then like if you're releasing a shooter right before Call of Duty, right before Black Friday, you know Call of Duty is going to be on sale Black Friday, but is your shooter going to be on sale Black Friday? You can't afford that sale, so you probably shouldn't release your game close to when Black Friday is going to happen. So that's That's kind of a thing. Don't be afraid to delay. And a perfect example of that is looking at February 2019, Sony made a smart decision in delaying days gone until april it's just not safe to move 
it's not a safe move for the product. It's also pro consumer. It gives gamers a chance to experience everything. So if you're butted up against something else, Days Gone's a big meaty game. They delayed the game for April solely to hit a different release window. So that wasn't like a developer issue. It wasn't a funding right. issue. It was just to be like in a different window. Uh, and then we had like <laughs> an example of this not happening was when we had Battlefield 1, Titanfall 2, and Call of Duty oh, Infinite Warfare God. all launching mm-hmm. within 14 days of each other. Hilariously, mm-hmm. Battlefield 1 and Titanfall 2 are both from EA. Like, they're like competing with themselves, like eating each other's lunch yeah. with two different yeah. shooters. And then, of course, you have Call of Duty's Activision. So um, that's another thing. And the last, but I won't you know, won't go too much into it because kind of dwindling, but the retailers. So like Best Buys, Walmarts, Targets, GameStops, etc. What is their rotation of stuff like at shelf space for like your game how are you going to get attention for shoppers like obviously black friday is a big time like nintendo n- notoriously doesn't put their stuff on sale on black friday except for like a select few and it's because they're relying on the fact that there's like three or four 50 times as many shoppers in all of the retail spaces so they just have more product on the shelf and yeah. like they're going to pick those things up because they're in the christmas shopping mood or holiday shopping mood or whatever right so right. those are all the things it's a lot there's a lot it of is. factors yeah. going into picking I think a release they all date. kind of boil down to essentially what makes probably the most sense the release with the release date choice which is attention right like it's all about like eyeballs on your you want eyeballs on your game you want your game to be the thing that's talked about and to shine and when there's a lot of noise it's hard to stand out i mean i I feel bad for the 19 games coming out this quarter because it seems like every like third day like it's like a new game has dropped here's a bunch of articles talking about it and then it's gone right and then that's as long as it gets in the conversation it'll be interesting there's a few that i imagine will stand out in the crowd right for a longer period of time of course her eyes uh elden ring probably being at the top of that list in regards to games that might be able to rise above the noise but i mean i just look i mean no one's there's i've seen no articles about arceus since cyber or since um horizon came out i've mm-hmm. seen I've, I've seen nothing about sifu I, these are games these are games that have started conversations you know arceus started the conversation about like pokemon's future and its direction going forward oh gosh not to mention dying light 2 like that game is being praised a lot and i don't hear anything from it and they've been out for at this point the time we're recording it they've been out for like 15 days less than 15 days right it's like these are games that should be should be you know talked about articles for months and yet they're now just disappearing uh, because because for good reason, right? Cyberpunk's next gen just dropped and people are praising it as the game that should have come out. Yeah. And taking up a lot right? of the media cycle. And yeah. Lost Ark also got a lot of attention because it's, you know, Amazon's finally kind of like big win so far uh, taking and kind of like uh, releasing, publishing this Korean game that was our soul already popular and highly anticipated. And then, yeah, Forbidden West comes out, but like, I guarantee you Lost Ark's going to fall off or Cyberpunk's going to fall off next week when Elden Ring comes out and Guild Wars 2's expansion will probably be talked about briefly and only to give way to Babylon's fall and and people will certainly have stopped talking about Cyberpunk by the time GTA 5's next gen version comes out like it's just everything's going to just completely overwrite the other whereas like normally these games would have seen lots of conversation for the full quarter of their time Mm -hmm. and so um, anyways that's kind of my little thesis there is that i think that attention attention is key here if you can nail that sweet spot where your game comes out when no other games are coming out while still within a profitable window right like no games are coming out january 3rd because that first week of january like everyone's saving money they just spend a bunch of money on christmas so nobody's dropping games then you gotta like kind of shoot for the end of the january window and people are like yeah i can finally spend money again christmas is behind mm-hmm. me so yeah it's and just it's like, not just the consumers having spent money it's also like corporations around the world yeah. have taken two weeks off you know yeah, around so yeah. like no one's working to like release a game and do the pr beats in the marketing to be ready in january without clobbering a family's or, you know, like your entire exactly. workforce is like holiday time off. So it's it's more of like the global culture of time off as well that also affects yeah, the beginning sort of, of trickles, January. But that's still, I mean, again, that means you're not releasing anything during that week and then you're not releasing mm-hmm. anything the week or two after. So right. that narrows the windows. I mean, you're, you're already not releasing games. You don't see games release on weekends, right? It just doesn't happen for good re- for lots of good reasons. But that's, that's what is that, uh, eight, eight days every month? 
and then multiply that by 12. So that's already like that's days you cannot release a game. Boom. There you've already acts like, you know, 90%. Yep. 10% of the entire year's days. More than that. <laughs> and more so than it's that, like, yes. yeah, more like 30%. Just, yeah, exactly. So, Is and it? then take holidays out yeah. of there. So there's another, you know, there's another chunk. And then the, the weeks or so after certain holidays, take that's another, that's another chunk. It's just like, it, there's not many days you can release games in a year and so and with more and more games coming out just in general uh this kind of thing i think is, of the math inevitable. route that you just went would actually be a lot easier to think about video games come out on tuesdays and fridays there's 52 <laughs> yeah, weeks in a right. year that's 104 days a week a year that's it wow. you got 104 yeah, days out of the much. whole year with which to release your titles and there are some like indie stuff that comes out on random days but mostly tuesdays and fridays sure. you yeah. not holidays so with it like you just look at the calendar that's 104 days minus yeah, anything that falls on a holiday <laughs> yes. there you go wow yep. cool well then let's talk about the the next the next question then which is well let's talk about some notable incidents let's talk about some notable times when this thing happened either around the same time where it was effect like affected things um, so i would say like games that came out within the same month that like one game overshadowed the other or 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 something notable happened as a result or again times when games came out the same day i want to talk about the, my favorite which is Doom Eternal and Animal Crossing coming out the same day on March 20th. It ended up becoming like a meme because the games are so polar opposite. Um, yeah. Back in 2020, you got Doom Eternal, which was like, Roar! killing, slaying, rend and tear. And then you had Animal Crossing, which was a game of cute little animal villagers. Um, so it worked. The release worked because two totally different art audiences, right? Targeting completely different audiences. So it, you know, I, I doubt the overlap was pretty significant there. Th there was overlap for sure, but it was probably not that significant to either game's bottom line. But it actually ended up being a zeitgeist thing, right? I believe even the creators of those games got into it. At least Doom did and it, it software. But there was lots of memes of like Doom guy and uh, uh, the the uh, most recognizable character from Animal Crossing, Isabel just getting together and like doing stuff like so doom goom guy was teaching her how to kill demons and she was teaching him how to do cute things like pick flowers and stuff <laughs> and <it was> great. <laughs> yep. so there's a whole sign of kind of like you know meme culture that kind of sprung up around that simultaneous release but it's not always uh rainbows and uh butterflies and cute little critters killing demons uh sometimes it really the games really do like you said kind of eat each other's lunch so there's some other times that that has happened you mentioned in 2019 anthem crackdown far cry and metro all coming out within that same month obviously there was 2017 i think we, we've talked a lot about horizon i mean horizon zero dawn the first one really got overshadowed by breath of the wild coming out within a couple weeks of each other in march that year horizon coming out first but breath of the wild just again overshadowing and dominating it to the point where pretty much killed its chances at game of the year and, and, and i've, I've mar remarked before about how similar those games are right like where it's like you you know you have a character that basically quote wakes up into a world of like that that's a primitive world but that has all this ancient technology lying around that is trying to kill them and has to discover the secrets of the past like I'm like yeah yeah breath of the wild and horizon forbidden west pretty or yeah sorry, that, that was like yeah that will go down in video game industry infamy like having those two so. games next to each other and it actually hurt yeah. horizon zero dawn a lot because so zelda much more, yep. was a much more beloved established franchise from nintendo uh, and way and more popular time. on brand new nintendo switch hardware uh, as well Yo. as the wii u you know like it had everything covered and horizon zero dawn here is guerrilla games coming out with a brand new ip a totally different genre first time doing anything different than kill zone and we had a whole episode about guerrilla games so go back and check that out if you want more details about that but between the two this is a perfect example of looking at your audience and looking what kind of games are hilariously enough like video game developers don't usually look out at what other folks are doing they're just yeah. they're just yeah. laser focused on what they're doing so they like horizon zero dawn developers at guerrilla games didn't know what breath of the wild was going to be so they just continue oh, going yeah. down uh -huh. and because video game developer cycles are like five years in advance you come up with an idea and run with it two years oh, later you get that thing i mean developers like, want to get that thing into the hands of players as soon as it's absolutely ready to go and then publishers have to sometimes push it or, yep. or bump it or whatever it's a whole thing yeah or, or, or consequently sometimes publishers slap a date on it and it's not ready and so they have to rush to get to that date and crunch and culture crunch, comes yeah. out from all that and also bad releases cyberpunk of course being the most infamous but yeah that kind of thing happens so it's like the publishers the developers just want to get the best possible game into the hands of players whenever it's ready and yep. obviously its progress will totally affect delays and stuff like that it will cause delays but sometimes the game's ready to go 
and the publisher, like you said, with Sony Bend and um, Days Gone, sometimes the publisher will choose a different w- window for it. And it's like, okay, well, I guess now we have more time to work on it, perfect it, but we'd rather it just you, be out, right? So yep. You anyways, just reminded uh, me of two other things that should have been answered in the previous question about like what dictates sure, release ahead. time windows. And one of those is publishers needing to meet fiscal year calendars. Yeah, like yeah, the fiscal year one. ends March 31st. And that's when like a chalk line is drawn about profits and revenue. And that's used in the projections for the next year and like how to set stock prices. And it affects everything about valuation. And that's extraordinarily important with economics and like capitalism and corporate world speak that I know nothing about, but I know sure. that's important. So that's one thing, like trying to get games out right before the fiscal year ends to meet promises and demands for the shareholders. And the other thing you mentioned was like, that you reminded me of we didn't talk about is the different types of games. Doom Eternal and Animal Crossing are perfect examples of this, of like those games are okay coming out on the same day because they reach entirely different folks. And there's a Venn yeah. diagram where there's some that inter- that overlap. And I'm one of them. I bought both on that you same are. day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thinking and, about you but I'm also like the major minority. There's an in- incredible amount of people that bought animal crossing and a huge amount of people that bought doom eternal and they're not going to be in conflict with one another and so i always argued with horizon forbidden west and elden ring coming out a week apart that that's the same case like elden ring just reaches a different audience entirely I, like the I, I don't more think it's entirely crowd. different case i think that they're both they are still both open world games that feature thoughtful combat you know like uh, yes horizon has difficulty sliders but or difficulty modes i mean but it still has that approach to combat that's like, okay, you're only fighting one or two things at a time and you're being strategic about, you know, doing uh, matching the right kinds of stuff and trying to, you know, break their weak points and watching their patterns and do- the heavy emphasis on dodging. I think that they ultimately still kind of feel the same and they both have, they're, they're going to be different in regards to like their storytelling prowess. But I do think that they're, I think that the, the, the feel of the games are similar enough. I already know for a fact there are people, I've seen conversation about people being like, which should I buy? I'm interested in both and I can only get one, oh, yeah, right? Yeah. So that's and in our still, spheres of influence, quite... we're going to see that a lot because like, yeah, that's where we that's are. True. But looking at just like, this is a, du- I don't, well, I don't want to get into a debate here because you're totally right. There's, there's, right, right. there's a lot more here to unpack and I'm not trying to make a declarative statement, but just to right. show our audience like a difference. Horizon Zero Dawn, the first game, sold 20 million copies. It's a PlayStation exclusive uh, and that that's that. Dark Souls 3 is the best selling from software title and it was released on everything, PC, Xbox, and PlayStation, and it only sold 10 million. Now, if you yeah. go through like the history of From Software and you look at all the sales, it does stack up higher than Horizon Zero Dawn. It's a whole genre. But that's so there's a you, lot of valid people points are to the like same game. There's still individual yeah, players, there is. right? Like exactly. Unique. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. So. But I'm I'm only bringing that up because a publisher could look at this and say, okay, Horizon Forbidden West from Sony side, like Sony's the publisher, right? Could look at Horizon Forbidden West and say, hey, this is for PlayStation fans. Look at how Horizon Zero Dawn performed. We're good. Sign the paperwork based on its budget for its specific title, what they paid Gorilla to do and like went with it. And that's why they chose a week difference from Elden Ring. Now, Elden Ring was also delayed. So like that probably threw a wrench into some of the planning. We're probably rambling a little too much here, but all of that does highlight like different games meet different audiences, and that is part of the discussion and the decision yeah. for the I did economics. To mention of those shortly things. before Doom Eternal and after yeah. Doom Eternal, Final Fantasy VII Remake also would drop. I believe that same month. It did. Yep, right so, before those yeah. two did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was also another one that was kind of crowding that that mm-hmm. window, but not the same day. That was kind of the important thing. So a couple others was uh, I think you mentioned already the Battlefield Titanfall Call of Duty. Uh, yeah, that was Bacol November 16, 2016. 2016. Yeah. Yep. November 2015. There wasn't an exact. There wasn't an exact date, and I, I thought I added it, but I guess I didn't. Rise of the Tomb Raider and Fallout 4 would come out on the same day. Two two big games, and then mm-hmm. in no, on November 18th, specifically November 18th, I see you added other stuff. Yeah, but... it's, it's a, that was a massive day. That was, was huge. It? Did they all come out that same day? Same day. Yep. All of yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That might be. That might. That might have our our March twenty fifth, twenty uh, twenty two beat then. But Dragon Age Inquisition, Far Cry four, Grand Theft Auto five, Shadow of War, and Watch Dogs all came out on November eighteenth, twenty fourteen. So yeah, and that's Grand Theft Auto five on PS four, Xbox oh, one, see. which was I like see. a re release yeah. for re-release, that. Yeah, but so I just threw it in there because it's the most po- most best selling oh, game playing of all it. time. Tons of people probably played oh, a yeah. bunch of the co- yeah a bunch of that on and that day. And the totally weird easy. like caveat with that was playstation 4 and xbox one had just come out a year ago 2013 so this was like the first fall where everyone had started to get their hands on it one year in and that's where we're at now we're actually one year in in a few months of the ps5 and xbox series consoles and we're seeing a day like march i'm sorry like february 25th 
in February 18th uh, and March 25th. So like, it's weird that the console cycles kind of affect this. I don't know if that's coincidental or not, but I just wanted to throw that date, November 18th, 2014, and those titles uh-huh. in there for that. A little Big Planet dropped the same day. And it was WWE, huge. A WWE w- 20K15 yep. dropped. Yeah. yeah, wow. It was a massive day. Yeah. That's insane. Vainglory, mm-hmm. Vainglory dropped that. Wow, that's crazy. Sorry, I'm just, I just I like Googled that, and there's a whole IGN article about games <laughs> that dropped that week. And yeah. there's so many games. Wow, that's insane. Yep. Yeah, that might be that might be be. And there was a Pokemon game that dropped a couple days later, Omega Ruby and Sapphire. Yep, um, on the twenty first, and then wow, Smash Bros then for Smash. Wii U. Yeah, what? yeah. <laughs> uh huh. That's insane. Yeah, twenty fourteen in, that, that in the fall. Be. Yeah, that was nuts. That might be an insane. One. Yeah, yeah, that might be the most insane. So crazy. All right, let, let's talk. Let's wrap up this real quick. Um, what are different strategies that companies do to handle the simultaneous game releases? Like, how do companies often respond to this kind of thing? How do they adjust their plans? or try to adjust sort of the PR around these kinds of things. Uh, and then we'll follow it up with how do you personally handle it? Really quickly say that obviously delay is the is the best mm-hmm. kind of tool they have in their arsenal uh, if, they, if they need to use it. I think, it, again, it's coming becoming more and more common for this kind of thing to happen, especially with only, you know, a third of the year uh, available to you to release games. And I think that they do, um, yeah, you know, it, it's always wise for, it, I think especially smaller companies that, you know, if, if, they're, if they're prescient enough and can afford to do it, right, like, uh, just bump it. I think the players understand in almost all cases I've ever seen the players. I, whenever I've seen that kind of thing happen where they're like, yeah, we're delaying this because this is coming out too close to this other huge thing. I think players often respond, oh, thank God. Like, I wanted to play both and now I can. Um, the only yep. people that are ticked off are the people who have no interest in the other thing. But I think even then they still understand, especially if it's like a multiplayer game where it requires <laughs> a large community to play. Uh, it could be a little frustrating, I think. But for the most part, I think people handle it. But other than that, there's, like I said, the PR stuff, right? You can kind of like celebrate the other games that are coming out and have some, you know, just kind of like show sort of solidarity. Um, I think that's what we saw with Bethesda, like with id Software, kind of celebrating it with Doom uh, and Animal Crossing. And um, yeah, that's kind of a strategy that I've, I've seen before where it kind of works. And uh, oftentimes you see, you know, especially the Sony studios like to congratulate each other on their games coming out. That's not necessarily related to the release windows, but I think that kind of thing happens where the, developers themselves are just sort of like you know get on twitter and just like congratulate each other on the games coming out and it's sort of like it's more of a goodwill gesture i think more than anything but it just definitely helps kind of like create a narrative that's like we're not worried about this we're confident right it's come, oftentimes i think more for the shareholders and stuff but any other any other things tools you think that the strategy that companies have to combat this kind of thing or or deal with yeah it? the one other thing that the games industry up is article highlights is also the idea that you just mentioned it briefly was that multiplayer games require in order for them to be sustained require Mm -hmm. a huge audience of engagement over a long period of time and i i wonder this could be a little conspiratorial but i wonder when you have a big title and i remember like battleborn versus overwatch when those came out close to each other Mm -hmm. and they were very similar if they're one of the two companies actually gutted some of their features and came out earlier to try and get ahead of the other one and knowing that they could add that content later through like content updates just to be the first one out. And so you talked about like delaying a game is a great idea to delay a already complete game and actually optimize it and have a chance to do something cool and put it out in a window where nothing else is competing with it. But also you could do the opposite where you cut content and say, no, let's get this thing out there now. And I want to say like Halo Infinite is kind of an, idea of that except it wasn't competing with much uh because it's an xbox exclusive and it was huge but you notice they don't have like co-op campaigns Uh, that's why i highlighted this as an example because stuff was cut like to get the game out uh you notice like the multiplayer was free to play which gets a huge audience to grab its attention it's on game pass which again increases its audience and its uh engagement rate And, and so like stuff like that i wonder if you have another year that ever repeats itself but like if you have another year like battlefield one titanfall two and call of duty all coming out at the same time which of those three games are going to cut content come out first and try to grab the engagement i think that's a strategy that's something that that gets considered for sure sweet awesome Mm -hmm. great what about yourself what do you do how two games come out the same day so march 25th i know you're as excited about you're probably more excited about kirby as excited about uh wonderlands and i don't know how you feel about ghostwire tokyo but what are you planning to do? How do you how are you going to navigate that and make a decision? I am assuming you you can probably afford to buy all three games at once, but I'm assuming you're mm-hmm. probably going to buy at most two at a time and then get the third one later. How are you going to navigate and make that decision? What's going to be the major thing that you use to deal with that? 
Yeah, interesting that time is my limiting reagent now and not necessarily money. Mm -hmm. And yes, I could right. afford to buy all three of them on release day, but what's the point if I can't play all three of them? Like, you might as exactly, well wait for yeah. a sale on another one later and just save the money for fun. Like, it's not doesn't make a difference. Um, and so what I'm planning on, and they are reaching different categories, and that goes back to, like, the marketing wonder behind it. Tiny Tina Wonderlands. That's a multiplayer co-op shooter, looter shooter. Right, I want to make carve out time with you and Ryan, friend of the show, Java Fiend, to play that game together online. And T Bone, uh, the four of us, like, set up a time. Let's go. Let's get it on release day and be in that hype train. Kirby Forgotten Lands is going to be the kid friendly. I play on weekends with the kids around and engage yeah. my son with that and like have fun. And it's kind of like not my mainstream gaming. But it's just a side side offshoot ghostwire tokyo fully depends on where i'm at with horizon forbidden west gran turismo <laughs> 7 and elden, and ring. elden ring so if yeah. i'm not ready with with those three games if i don't have any completion in those three games i'm I'm not buying ghostwire tokyo at all right. i want it i would like, buy you it only play it at night it's gonna be exactly major it's horror not, elements yep. you can't play with your kids but you're also it's not multiplayer so you're not going to be able to play it with other people Right, so that's not uh, that's not a limiting factor as well. You don't have to wait for other people, so you can just get on and play it like when yep. you have time to yourself. But I also understand that it's like it's very much in the same vein of like heavy story driven single player experience that mm -hmm. you cannot play around your kids. Maybe good, you know. So for me, the other factor then is you know you mentioned time, right? So the other factor for me is review scores, right? Like, eh, you know, I am of the mind that until a game comes out and it's in the hands of players. It, it is a Schrodinger's game, right? Every single, no matter how heavily anticipated, no matter what caliber of developer, everyone's capable of a flop and everyone's mm -hmm. capable of a surprise hit, right? And so, yeah, that's kind of me. I'll even say I, I have a lot of confidence in Elden Ring, but it is still subject to the same thing. It could just be bad and misrepresented by all of the so reviews so far. I, I doubt it, but it could be, right? right? So, so Ghostwire Tokyo, Tokyo falls on that right now. Like, it's so far from release. There's no early indications, no, you know, beta test or demo out there for people to get their hands on and decide for themselves or even industry reviewers. Nothing, 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 nothing about that game so far. So it's just a Schrodinger's game for me, right? It could yeah. be incredible or it could be bad. So when those, re when that review, uh, you know, for me, all eyes end up being on the review embargo. It's very mm. common for me to wait until review embargo day for me to even pre-order any game. So that is uh, that is so that's true for all three of those games actually coming out that day. I'm going to kind of see what the reviews say and not to say that I will only listen to the reviews. I'll listen to my heart as well. If I had to say like in order of interest, it, it definitely goes Wonderlands, Ghostwire and then Forgotten Lands, Kirby. Mm hmm. But who knows? Kirby might jump to the top of that list if it's got like 95 on Metacritic, right? Yep. Yep. And then same with Ghostwire, like Ghostwire and Kirby, I can play whenever i kirby and more even more so i can play whenever i want because i can play it with in front of my kid ghostwire i don't have to wait for friends necessarily although i don't have to wait for friends for tiny tina's either so yeah that's kind of like one of the things that goes into it is just like how is it being received because my interests these days do often align with what reviewers for the most part are interested in and and they can definitely sway my opinion one way or another mm -hmm. so yeah and it's interesting about the warning signs of a flop you can take like a big company like CD Projekt Red, who's released hit after hit after hit, and then Cyberpunk's anticipated, but the red sign or the the warning red signs flags, were yeah. like mm -hmm. only letting PC players review it. So all the reviews yeah. were like PC only, and they played a lot of weird shenanigans leading up to review with weird embargo limitations, and like that was warning signs that we now in hindsight can see and, and can apply that to the next round of games coming from these these three developers, uh, and then going to like Fallout seventy six taking a huge risk. If there's a giant change in direction from like a previous entry to a new one, that's a huge risk. And while Bethesda's renowned and awesome, and you have Fallout, which is a wonderful series of games, of course, no, nothing bad could happen, right? They made Elder Scrolls, same engine. Fallout 76 is going to be amazing. And obviously it was not because they took a huge new direction. And that's like the online only aspect and like always connected. So here in those three games, Ghostwire, Kirby, and Tiny Tina, Kirby is the one that's taking a new direction, but it's also mm -hmm. Nintendo. Uh, so that is a mystery. Like maybe there's a chance here that Kirby does flop and it does come out. And it's not as good as what Nintendo's capable of in the past. Highly unlikely. Nintendo but can be, I, I don't know though. No, you know, man, like Nintendo has a couple of franchises that it seems like they absolutely make sure are fantastic, right? Yeah. Uh, Zelda and Mario are the two that come most to mind. I, I know uh, Smash Bros, right? Like these games yep. come out and it's like, these are like the headliners. This is what Nintendo's like. We are not compromising the quality of these games. 
Some of their other games, though, Donkey Kong, Kirby, like, they're kind of like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Sometimes they <laughs> you do know what outsource I mean? them. Like, there's other developers yeah, that partner with true. Nintendo, like mm-hmm. Rezo and such, that have some of the remasters and things, and they're not held to as much scrutiny or as, like, tightly like quality control is some other things, but I don't know. I think Kirby is, I hope is so. No, I really a, do. I, I want the, Kirby, the only yeah, thing that, yeah. about their most latest release on Kirby for the switch that I have heard is that it's just ridiculously easy and it's very like kid friendly mm-hmm. and it's not engaging to like quote gamers, whatever sure, you want to sure, call sure. like, and so it's, or it's a good adults, solid game. Right, it's bug right. free. It plays well. It's fine, but it's, it's really appealing to kids and it just doesn't like, grab the adult audience it seemed like kirby mm-hmm. is now switching to that whole like open world formula like everything else is doing with arceus and breath of the wild so like it's trending in that direction it sounds like it could be good it looks good it's showing well it's got a lot of hype and buzz around I guess, it you know i keep talking but, about it like i'm like i'm interested in it and i literally still haven't even seen a trailer because i missed that nintendo direct oh I dude you gotta that, go back yeah. the only thing i've seen i saw that he could become a car and i'm like yeah yeah it's awesome i'm into yeah. that yeah it's hilarious. But, it's I mean, ridiculous. I loved Kirby, right? Like, I forget which one it was. It was, there was one, I guess, GameCube or N64. There was, like, an adventure one, right? And I adored it. I love. I remember playing it with my cousin, like, at good times. So I, I mm-hmm. have a good, big fondness for Kirby. I just haven't played a Kirby game in a long time. And, you know, like you said, yeah, they are taking a big departure. I mean, even Elden Ring, right? Like, it's taking a pretty big departure from its formula, too. So there's definitely, but the difference between that and other games that have done the same thing is they had a you know closed network test for like three days, mm-hmm. months and months before the game came out, which means that the game was in a playable enough state to get it in the hands of like thousands of players. But also there's a, a loud test. enough audience. And I say loud enough because I would not say big enough, but loud enough audience for Elden Ring players that if anything was like notably wrong or any big yeah. problems, we uh-huh. would have heard that from the rooftops. We've already heard it. We have like, already heard it in the sense that with the um the Dark Souls uh the the Dark Souls three network exploit uh, yep. code mm-hmm. code execution exploit literally the minute that that dropped on Dark Souls three, uh people started going through the base code of the network test, yep. like what they had at the network test and discovered that there was the same exploit and they like were shouting it from the rooftop. So yeah, yep. you're right. Definitely, it is a it is a is a it is a passionate fan base that. <laughs> scrutinizes a every passionate. that is yes well yeah they're passionate and they and their passion drives them to obsessively scrutinize every little deep i mean this is a game that has like a very very intricate nuanced combat system too so yep. uh yeah of course these are people that are like practiced in scrutinizing every inch of that game uh and those games so yeah mm-hmm. you're right if something was wrong and something was screaming foul, they would have absolutely made it very clear their feelings about it. So the fact that both Bandai Namco and FromSoft were able to, or were, were confident enough to drop a network test of like a large portion of the game, mm-hmm. like months before its release speaks to how good of a state that it's in and, and the yep. o- ultimate like overall trust you can have in it being a, at least a somewhat quality release because They've had lots of articles like they've been giving a lot of attention to it, which is exactly what you want to do with a huge departure. Right. Like you want to get it in the hands of people so you can get that early like, hey, guys, this works. Right. Like this works, huh? And get all that feedback before, um, you know, before you just drop it in the hands of people and are like, oh, God, this sucks. (laughs) Like, why did they go this way with it? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So cool. All right. uh, Last question. Uh, We can wrap it up real quick. We've already mentioned, uh, the, I originally worded this question as, do you think this is occurring more often, the fact that these games are simultaneously releasing? Um, I think we've established that it is, but not that there haven't been notable times it's happened in the past. Um, but yeah, so why is it happening more often then? If it's not happening more often, do you think it's just a matter of like attention, right? Like it, like people are paying more attention to it thanks to whatever reason. So and see if we can answer that really quickly in a couple of yes. sentences. But what are your thoughts on that two, kind of idea? Two answers. Two, it's a two-faceted answer that are both yeah. kind of related. One is the hardware infrastructure of consoles has aligned itself with PC since the PS4, Xbox One era. So now we have the next gen, which is PS5, Xbox Series consoles. It's all like in parity of PC. It's the x86 architecture. It's easy to port games. It makes it easy to put more out as far as like compiling and compatibility issues. So like that is newer now in the, since 2013 to today than it has been in the history of gaming. So it, it that allows easier approachability on the hardware platforms. The second facet to that answer is the engines are becoming easier to 
like share. So we have Unity, we have Unreal, uh, and many more. Uh, Decima is responsible for both Horizons and Death Stranding, and companies are willing to share that asset and license it out and use that as a monetization strategy. And so we have easier to lower barriers of entry than we ever had. And then we also have companies like big publishers funding indie movements, so PlayStation and ID at Xbox and uh, EA Origins, and the list goes on, like lots of support and help for getting the indie movement up and running, as well as a, an engine they can just jump into and start throwing art assets in and game design things, mechanics, and create a game. So you can create a better quality game faster and cheaper than we ever have before. And as long as that continues in this direction, we're going, the gaming industry is going to be more prolific. There's just going to be more and more and more every single month. And then before you know it, the year just gets so stuffed that all of the strategies we'd mentioned in the first third of this, co- this conversation are all just going to be meaningless. Cause it's like every, everything you want to put out there is going to bump up against something else to compete against. And it's going to be bedlam out there. So that's kind of why this is happening. Like we're just seeing all this new stuff that we've never seen in the history of the gaming industry kind of coming to fruition now. That, yeah. That's why. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, I think also uh, I think the other side of the coin is the fact that, yeah, it's also just getting more attention, right? Ideas and the gaming community is getting more intelligent, right? Over time, there there's more of us, right? More people and more. And then, of course, the speed and access of information, right? People Mm -hmm. know what to look for, how to look for things, how to analyze things, how to discuss things. And uh, just overall, the, the community around gaming is getting bigger and smarter. Mm-hmm. and uh and also has way more access to things than they did before so i do think that there's just more attention on this kind of thing too and yep. yeah something like something like march 20th gets memed right like the the and then it just becomes a thing it comes becomes part of the culture of gaming at that point but these two games came out on the same day and we all had a good laugh about it for a while so i think that that's uh that's that's another big component here is it's it's i do think it is happening more like factually objectively happening more frequently i also think this year is an outlier right i don't think we're going to see another quarter like this um uh probably ever again well maybe possibly but this also is a particular confluence of circumstances that has enabled this quarter one 2022 19 games coming out situation and (laughs) so but but i also think that is also just getting more attention because of just the nature of the internet at this point in Mm -hmm. time um and we have like we have twitch streaming we have youtube streaming we have facebook streaming have different engagements oh yeah your favorite influencer says you know oh this your favorite influencer you have two influencers and one of them says they're getting kirby that day and the other one says they're getting you know ghostwire tokyo you're gonna go with the influencer you like more more probably than the game you like more right so you can be a part and of their that audience of that, that you're community. like friends with right exactly so if, right, you're, yeah. if your so influencer likes kirby with that yep. community yep. Mm-hmm. yep yep as opposed to like what do you want to play so it's a whole new kind of and that's world. very new yeah very new exactly. like you think gen yeah. xers were kids when arcades were a thing and like maybe the super nintendo and genesis were happening and there was no internet live streaming and there's no like interconnected societies and so like gaming was very niche and like so of course there was just not as much demand and demand's not going to produce product and now fast forward to today you have the gen xers aged the millennials aged and now you have gen zers coming up doing all of this social media engagement the demand is just higher and when you have yeah. high demand you're going to meet that with more supply so just more just more 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 on that facet as well it's it's only going to continue to grow that's yep that's what's happening yep. yeah Cool. All right. Well, what listener do you think about simultaneous game releases? What do you think about? What are some examples that we didn't have time for or just forgot about of games that came out in the same week, month, year that had huge effects or some kind of other um, notable occurrence? And yeah, we just want to hear your thoughts on all that. And Termite will share where you can share those thoughts if you have them. Tell us why you are going to buy Horizon Forbidden West before Elden Ring at... 80bitpodsmash.com. That's our landing website where you can find links to all of our social media outlets to tell us those things. And that is Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Reddit. We have a Discord server as well. Links to all of those, 80bitpodsmash, 80bitpodsmash.com. And if you are listening to us on YouTube and you want to know what podcasting platform, audio platforms we are on, our the links are also there. Spotify, Google Play, whatever that's called, Apple Podcasts, as well as Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and any other podcasting platform you would like. The RSS feed is there you can throw it in any app please go take the time to tell your friends about us go give us a review like a video like an audio uh write to us we will respond on the show 
expect two responses. Like those things do bubble up. So if you want to be kind of part of our conversation or influence the things that we say or do or think, uh, give us your thoughts, comments, questions, concerns, and ideas. We would love to hear from you. 80bitpodsmatch.com. All right. So this, as you can tell, this month is kind of going to actually be themed around these releases um, because we obviously cannot do all three of those games and talk about stuff about them in that same week. So in honor of the fact that Kirby will be coming out later this year, the year later this month, we'll do our Everything Kirby episode next week and talk about all the Kirby games that we love and all the Kirby Woo-hoo. trivia and facts and history that we can dredge up out of the internet or from our own personal experience. And that'll happen on March 14th, so we'll see you then. See, Oof. see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>